All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ironman World Championships, Kona, the all-women's world championship race. Our presenter this evening is Coach Molly Zarr. I will let Molly do her full introduction, but um, Molly's a coach with a longtime coach and athlete with QT2 Systems and a four times Kona finisher. She's in a great place to share all of her knowledge with you both from the standpoint of an athlete on the course and, a, and someone who's coached many athletes in the race. And I'll turn it over to you, Molly. Thank you, Reem. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to your course preview. Um, we will try to get through as much as we can, but as Reem mentioned at the end, we will do questions. So if there's anything that you're not quite sure of or unclear about, I'll do my best to answer. But uh, I should note before we start presenting, the athlete guide as of this recording has not been published yet. Um, it is unlikely that a whole lot is going to change, but uh, obviously once that is available, make sure that you read through that very closely and make sure that nothing has changed and you understand every bit of it. But um, yeah, as Reem said, uh, my name is Molly Zar. I have completed the race in Kona four times. I've been coaching with QT2 since 2009. I've done uh, 25 Ironman races over the last 20 years, coached many, many athletes to Ironman finishes, including in Kona, uh, won my age group five times and a uh, Lake Placid Ironman. Um, and I've also, aside from racing in Kona, I've also watched the race, uh, I think six times at this point. So I'm very familiar with the course, very familiar. I've trained on it a bunch and uh, seen many, many people race there. All right. So for this presentation, we're going to go through the QT system, Q2 systems, five cornerstones, uh, your final weeks, your pre-race check-in and logistics, what you want to do race the day before and race morning. And then we'll go through the whole course. And then on race day, the pacing and fueling. Um, so we'll start, uh, this is obviously all going to be just good information for pretty much any race that you do, the QT2 systems, five cornerstones, your training, your restoration and your day-to-day -day nutrition, your fueling, your pacing, and your mental fitness, because none of the race can happen. Uh, you can't reach your potential without covering all of these five cornerstones. You can train, you can be smart, get all that done, but if you're not fueling properly, if you're not recovering and, and getting your nutrition in and pacing well and all that stuff, then your whole race is going to fall apart. So you need to make sure that you're covering all of these things. Um, all right. So we have your final week in your training and pacing. So uh, the we've got the taper, your final key race specific sessions, race specific sessions, sorry, uh, trying to simulate the race conditions and intensities during training. So in this case, obviously, you're talking about an ocean swim. Obviously, this is not possible for everybody until you actually get there. Um, but if you uh, are doing your training, I'd definitely recommend being in a pool without a wetsuit. If, you know, I know myself, I train a lot in a lake in the spring, in the fall, in the summer. Um, and it's just better to, to get used to swimming without your wetsuit. Um, a lot of steady riding on the trainer or outside. It's a relatively flat-ish course compared to a lot of the, the hilly courses that I think a lot of uh, North American Ironman athletes race in, say, Lake Placid or... Uh, Wisconsin or something like that. So you want to get used to being in your aero bars, especially because it's going to be windy. Um, so you also, uh, you know, ride in wind if you get the opportunity. If there's a windy day, it's not a bad idea to head outside and and do some riding in the wind and uh, consider overdressing for your run workouts. So we'll, we'll cover these a little bit more specifically as we go through as well. Um, but be prepared for hot, humid, and windy weather. And there's also potential for rain. I think a lot of people are so concerned about the heat and the humidity um, and the sun that they don't realize that actually it can rain on that course and it has rained on the course. I don't remember, I don't think it rained last year um, for the women anyway, but like the men's race, they definitely got some rain. I have raced there with some rain. It's not likely to be terrible, but you know, don't be afraid of rain. And obviously it's not, uh, you're not going to be cold. So don't worry about that. Um, work on heat acclimation if possible. That's something that you should start now if you haven't already. Um, that, somebody has their microphone. Uh, can somebody make sure they mute their microphone? Thank you. Um, 
make sure that you uh, do eat one workout per day or use the sauna. Um, this just means choose one workout. Obviously, we're talking about bike or run because you can't really heat acclimate in the water, but um, where you are either overdressing or maybe doing an indoor workout and uh, turning off your fan on your trainer or, you know, turning up the heat in the, in the room. You don't want to torture yourself. Don't, don't do all your key workouts this way. Don't, um, you know, don't crank the heat up to 95 degrees, just something to get you used to being in uh, a warmer environment. Um, and sauna can be helpful as well. Uh, you know, work your way up to 20 to 30 minutes. If you can, if you have access to one that can be helpful too. Um, if you can do that daily, that's great. Um, that can just help a little bit. Uh, when you get there, train on the course if you can. Uh, although there's obviously, there's not a whole lot of options once you're there. There's not a ton of extra roads to, to go on. Um, but obviously you wanna be able to uh, train on the swim course so you can kind of take note of some landmarks and sighting and get used to that water. Uh, the ride to and from Javi. Uh, and also just a little note about training on the course in Kona for the bike. Don't practice on the first out and back on Kuwakini Highway. That's just, it's tight. It's, there's not a lot of shoulder. It's very busy. Um, and I'd actually recommend also just don't start like right at the pier. Get get out of town, get up on the Queen K. You're not missing anything uh, that needs to be seen. You'll see it in a car anyway, but um, you're not missing anything that needs to be seen like right in town. It's just a little bit dangerous, a little bit too crowded. So it's best to just like get onto the Queen K and start from up there. Um, and then, of course, your dress rehearsals. You want to test your uh, all your gear and what you're going to be wearing and uh, your race setup and you get your bike all ready to go um, and all of that. Um, train your race targets. Don't try to uh, overdo things and, um, you know, follow your heart rates, follow your rate of perceived exertion, your pace, your power numbers, all those things. Uh, there is no chance to gain fitness in the final week. So no panic training, no feeling like, oh, I'm going to do this one speed session. Like, don't worry about any of that. Just focus on being uh, training frequently and by feel. Um, you know, you don't want to stop entirely. I know sometimes we can get a little bit tired during our tapers and uh, feel like you want to totally rest. And you definitely want to be rested, but you still want to kind of keep frequent workouts so that you're keeping the blood flowing. And um, yeah, obviously don't overtrain. There's no reason to do any extended long workouts. You've already got all your endurance taken care of um, or on the side of recovery. If you're feeling really, really tired, you know, either slow down or skip a workout if you need to. Um, it is more important to feel rested than to be sharp, uh, and then include days off as needed. Uh, all right. So now your final weeks in your nutrition, uh, fluid intake, obviously you always want to remain hydrated, um, at least half of your body weight in ounces. I guess that's missing half of your body weight in ounces. Uh, in addition to what is lost during workouts and nutrient density, this is huge. And I think all of us suffer from this. Like it is, it's hard to get this many servings of fruits and vegetables in a day, but, you know, focus on it, really try to, to keep your body fueled appropriately. Um, replenishment meal day prior to the long run, high in carbs, low in fat. That's basically just you know, make sure that you are fueling and not trying to be, I think sometimes when the, the volume drops a little bit, you can kind of uh, under eat, under fuel a little bit, under eat. So make sure that you are fueling, especially those last couple of long workouts, make sleep a priority, make sure that you are going to bed and, uh, you know, sleeping as much as you can, at least seven to eight hours, seven and a half to eight hours a night. Um Consider taking any inflammatory measures, omega threes, um, and hydration, and reduce stress and sleep. Stress is huge. I know it's hard with most of us have busy lives and other things going on, but really try to, uh, you know, eliminate as much stress as you can just in these final weeks, and then you can go back to being a normal stressful person. You know, in October, uh, taper down your caffeine target less than eight hundred milligrams a week. 
And uh, do not forget to drink your recovery drink after workouts. Again, this goes with, uh, I think, sometimes feeling like, oh, if I skip my recovery drink, then I'll maybe be a tiny bit lighter. I'll, you know, I don't want to take these extra calories. Take those extra calories. It's going to make all that you're going to be much better off feeling recovered and uh, sharp rather than, you know, not taking in an extra 200 calories after your workout. All right. So race week, nutrition and restoration. Uh Again, eat a relatively normal diet during race week, especially if you're going out early. I know this can be hard because, um, you know, there's restaurants and there's a lot of stuff going on. But, you know, try to make sure that you are eating relatively normally. Again, don't cut back on your on your food too much. You want to add extra salt to your meals. Obviously, this is a very hot race. You're going to be losing a lot of sweat and a lot of salt. So you want to make and you're going to have to drink a lot to make up for that. So you want to uh, make sure that you are taking in extra salt, focus on your hydration, drink plenty of fluid sports drinks or water. Um, in the last couple of days leading up to the race, uh, you know, you're going to be peeing a lot. That's, that's a good thing. Focus on that, really stay hydrated. Uh, and especially again, like walking around and enjoying the town, you'd be surprised how much you can sweat out or just forget to drink. So just have a bottle with you everywhere you go. Always um, continue to taper down your caffeine intake with none on the day prior. Uh, we do a fat load five days prior. I, this is this is probably one of my favorite things about pre-race. Uh, given that it's a Saturday race, this is going to be probably your dinner on Monday night. Um, we call it a fat load. It's basically just have like a, a relatively fat heavy meal, whether it's whatever your fat heavy meal of choice is. If you're a burger and fries person, uh, pizza, pizza, um, quesadillas, something along those lines. It's just a way to sort of make sure that you are uh, fueled up and recovered and and ready. And I every time I do this, the following day, my workouts are like, it's like that's when everything clicks with my taper. So don't skip that. I would definitely recommend doing that. Um, it just, it just, it, there's something about it that makes you feel way better. Um, all right, but then after that, you want to taper your fat and fiber consumption in the final days before the race, so that your not your gut isn't uh, you know, full of would just it's your digestion will be much better that way. Obviously, um, your carb load two nights before, uh, that's your big pasta dinner or rice or whatever your again carb of choice is, and then your big uh breakfast the day before. Um, and then again, continue to make sleep a priority eight hours per night, uh, especially again on the island. Obviously, for most of us uh, that I'm speaking to right now, I'm guessing you're coming from the mainland U.S., which means we are traveling west to this race, which is a good thing. Um, it's always much easier to adjust to a time zone further west. Uh, but what's going to happen is you're going to be very tired early in the day and you're going to wake up super early in the morning. Personally, uh, I don't uh necessarily try to adjust to the chime there uh so you miss a few sunsets but i would say if you're tired at five o'clock and you know go to bed it for someone like myself i go to bed pretty early so that's like the equivalent of 11 o'clock at night here which i'm never awake at 11 o'clock at home so um you know make sure that you're getting sleep even if it means going to bed crazy early um and stay off your feet as much as possible obviously there's a lot going on during race week, it's very exciting, uh, but try to give yourself kind of windows of opportunity and say, all right, I'm going to go to the expo for this little time, but then that's it. Like, uh, you know, just try to stay off your feet and try to stay rested. All right. Final week's fueling. Fuel in accordance with your plan during every session. Again, this is just training your gut, making sure that you are ready to be taking in all those, uh, all those sports drink you're going to have to drink all the gels that you're going to have to take in and all that stuff uh use the products you plan to use on race day and uh and again use your recovery drinks um and on race day fueling may be the most important and most likely limiter on performance and one that you have complete control over so again don't don't uh forget to practice that and don't you know on the day make sure that you're doing everything that you're supposed to be doing. Uh, all right. Mental fitness in the final weeks, reduce external pressures as best you can. Again, as I said, everybody has other commitments, other life things going on, but <clears throat> try to save the, the worst stuff 
put it off as, as best you can. Um, focus on the things you can control, your attitude and your fueling. These are the, obviously, there might be little things that come up or, or worries or whatever, but you can only control your attitude and your fueling. Um, trust your preparation. I think everybody who is going into this race is probably trained a whole lot. Uh, you know, you all had to qualify to get there. You already know how to complete an Ironman race. Uh, you know how to do that. I mean, it's hard to to remember that even though it's Kona, it's still just another race. I promise you the distances are exactly the same. Um, you know, it has its own challenges, but every race has its own, its own challenges. So trust that you're, you're training and that you've prepared well. Um, try some visualization. Um, think about what a great performance looks like. And don't forget to think about how you're going to respond if, if something doesn't go well. So obviously it's a long day. Sometimes things aren't going to go so well and think about how you're going to handle it or what you're going to say to yourself when something doesn't go the way that you want it to go, how you're going to get through that. Um, list out your goals and your targets. Uh, your goals uh, are, are you have a hundred percent control over and your targets are your numbers based. So the targets is like, this is the power that I'm going to ride, or this, this is the heart rate that I'm going to focus on, or, you know, that kind of thing for the run. Um, and then internalize the race specific workout feels. So just note during your, your last workouts, what feels like to go at race pace, what it feels like, um, you know, to, to deal with that. Um, and then enjoy the feeling of extraordinary fitness. Be grateful. I think it's it's a slog and I, I'm gonna be there with you and I'm kind of going through it now where it's like some of the sometimes you just don't love going out for those workouts, but it does feel pretty good to be able to do those workouts. So, you know, really focus on how good it feels to be in this position and how to be ready for this race. All right. This is a unique event. Obviously, this is, as far as I know, it is the first ever all women Ironman of any kind, which is kind of exciting. Um, last year was obviously kind of a split race, but we did have some men on our day. So it wasn't entirely just women, um, you know, take pride in being part of this unique first. It's, you know, who knows if it'll happen again. They say that they're going to keep doing it and they probably will, but we, you know, things, obviously the last couple of years have taught us anything, things can change. So enjoy uh, being part of this. There's only going to be one change tent in transition. So it's going to be a little bit easier. And I can be like, which tent's mine? That one's yours. Um, there's going to be uh, swim waves, which I think um, you're probably, uh, most of us who've been racing the last couple of years are used to the self-seated sw rolling swim starts. So this is a little bit newer um, and they're probably, it's a pretty big group. Even last year when we did the waves, it was, um, you know, a couple hundred people. So it's a, it's a good size group. I don't know if they're going to split it. Uh, like I said, the, they haven't decided yet what the, uh, the swim waves are going to be yet. They might split some of the larger age groups in half. I'm not really sure, but uh, definitely be prepared to have a few more people around you at the start than you're used to. Uh, a little less ego than usual on the course. I think we're all used to uh, some of the men being uh, not liking being passed or, or that kind of thing. So that'll be missing from this race. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, be aware too, again, with, with the swim waves, you may be, uh, you may be passed in the early parts of the bike, uh, which is again, not, not as, typical with uh, the seated starts. Um, and then just to know whether you qualify be being first in your age group or 50th, you earned your right to be there. I know there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, oh, anybody could get a slot. Well, I, you still had to finish an Ironman. You still had to show up. You still had to do the training. You earned your right to be there. Don't, don't quantify it and say, well, but I, I didn't do that. It doesn't matter. You played by their rules and uh, you earned your slot. Um, and then what to expect in Hawaii. Hawaii is a little different if you have not been there. Um, it's a fantastic place. I love going there. I'm very excited to get to go again. Um, obviously, it is hot and it is humid. Um, so be prepared for that. Everything on the island is more expensive than you're used to. So consider bringing certain food items with you. Um, it, I usually bring like my, my, if you're a QT2 person, you use applesauce as your pre-race breakfast. Uh, I usually bring that and like pretzels and some random things, just so it, just a few 
things that I don't have to worry about buying there that are going to be a lot more expensive. Um, plus that way, once that stuff is out of my suitcase, then I have more room to bring things home. But um, but yeah, just be aware that, I mean, everything, restaurants and stuff, there's a little bit of sticker shock involved because um, everything has to be imported. And, and, uh, and that can also make sometimes stuff hard to get. So if there's something really crucial that you need, try and find it as early as you can once you arrive, just to make sure that you have it. Um, Island time is a little bit slower. Be patient when you go to restaurants and things like that. Sometimes things can move a little bit more slowly, um, but just just relax. Just be aware. Um, I, I already mentioned this before. If you're coming from the U.S., don't try too hard to adjust to the time. So uh, it makes getting up a race day so much easier. I mean, you you miss the sunset sometimes if you're going to bed or as early as I like to when I get there. Um, but I watch plenty of them when I'm there the last couple of days after. And it's just when my alarm goes off at two 30 in the morning to eat breakfast on race day, it's like, Oh, I'm ready. Um, the course is still a busy highway. Be very careful in your training. It is, uh, you know, there's a pretty good sized shoulder, but just be very mindful and aware of your surroundings, especially at intersections. There's not a ton of intersections once you get out of town. So that's kind of a nice thing, but um, and then obviously, obviously always be respectful. Uh, the community has been hosting this event for 40 years. Be gracious guests, just be, be kind. Don't, don't run in the road. Don't cycle in the middle of the road. Uh, be kind to motorists. I think there's been a lot of talk the last couple of years too, about how people don't want us there. And I remember hearing it last year and I was so worried about going. And to be honest, when I was actually there, everybody I ran into was happy with the race and excited to talk to us. So I don't, don't be too worried about any of that stuff, but still obviously be a good guest of the community. All right. So now we're going to go through our pre-race logistics. Um, obviously you want to review the athlete guide when that is up. I'm kind of surprised it's not, we're still, we're under four weeks to go, but I would imagine the next week or so that'll be there, but make sure that you read through everything because few things might be different um get your bike tuned up make sure that that's all ready to go there are mechanics on the island but obviously you want to make sure that you're it's close to race ready before you get there um make your list make sure that you list out everything that you're going to need buy anything that you need uh get make sure you have the correct goggles it's fair you can bring more than one pair of goggles tinted goggles are almost well, definitely going to be uh, probably the preferred choice here, but, uh, you know, obviously goggles are easy and don't take up much space. So bring whatever you need, um, charge and replace any batteries you have, pack all your stuff, confirm your reservations, um, plan on your race check-in time. I do not believe this year, uh, I think it was a COVID thing and they're not doing it, but again, this is something you'll have to check with the athlete guide. I don't believe that you're going to have to sign up for a time to sign up to check in for the race. Um, but you can check in on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And then for uh, your, for the bike check gear check-in and stuff that may, they used to do it where they'd split it and have like the first thousand people would be until two o'clock and the next people would be after that. They might do that again. Again, that's something you'll have to review once they release that information. Um, this race is again, a little bit unique. They have some additional race week events. There is a training swim on Sunday, October 8th. If you happen to be there early, um, you do have to register for that. You pay money for that. Um, but it's just, a, it's a fun event. There's a lot of people uh, and it's basically the whole, you just swim the whole swim course, uh, which you may be doing anyway. But if you happen to be there, that's a cool event to do. There's a uh, cultural heroes of Hawaii, Hawaiian cultural legacy on the 9th at six. There's an iron kids race if you're bringing kids with you and they want to do that. It's a dip. It's a, yeah, it's a, a swim run basically. And that's down by the pier. That's at four on October 10th, the parade of nations, um, which is kind of fun. Uh, and typically, again, this is something that's not on the schedule yet. Typically the parade of nations happens. And then that leads to the opening of the expo. I don't see anything yet about the opening of the expo. So I'm not positive when that's going to happen, but um the underpants run, you've probably heard of that. If you, that's just, I mean, that's not like a run run. That's just totally a slow jog down a lead drive. That's fun, whether you want to participate or just watch the chaos. Um, and then the welcome banquet, which will be uh, on the 12th at 6 p.m. That's a dinner that's behind the hotel. Um, and that's pretty cool. If you don't usually go to those, that can be pretty fun because 
uh, you know, obviously it's a very unique event and it's a, a great way to kind of get excited for the race and they do the athlete briefing afterwards. So that's, that's important. Um, all right. Race check-in logistics, logistics expo again, with the information we have now, I'm not positive, uh, when, what the schedule of the expo is. And one note too, is in the past, it's not actually at the same spot as the athlete registration. It's actually down a uh, lead drive, probably about a half mile in front of the beach. You'll have to check and see, uh, when that's going to be open. And when you want to check that out, but athlete check check in is at uh, King Kamehameha Kona Beach Hotel in the ballrooms uh, Tuesday and Wednesday from nine to four, and then Thursday from nine to two. There is no Friday pickup, so don't show up uh, to the island on Friday and be like, "Oh, I can just go register." You cannot uh, make sure that you do that before two p.m. on Thursday. Um, bring your active.com registration code and have that out on your phone and ready to go. They scan it like three times as you go through the process and your photo ID. Uh, get to the expo early and again, limit your time there. Uh, you know, one walkthrough is sufficient, I promise you. Um, and then the, as I mentioned, the English speaking briefing is after the welcome dinner uh, but it will be online afterwards. It's because I honestly staying up until eight o'clock and I know last year it ran a little bit late. So if you're tired and you need to go to bed, I would honestly, I would go to bed and watch that online the following day. But um, it is in person at the, after the welcome dinner. Uh, your race packet has what you have in all of your other Ironman races, your bib, your stickers, your swim cap, uh, your bike checkout ticket, your wristband, and all of your gear bags. Um, the interesting thing about this race is that you should know is the gear bags, you do not have access to your bike and rung bags on race morning. I know at every other Ironman race, it's like you drop it off the day before, but you can go back the next morning and you can throw a banana in your run bag or you can check everything. Uh, you do not have access to those on race morning. I, you actually, I should say with a little asterisk, you kind of do, but you have, you would have to find a volunteer who will escort you to your bag. Uh, so it's kind of a pain and it, it's not something that I recommend. So just expect not to have access to that bag on race morning. Um, and then all the things that you're going to need for uh, your gear bags and then Another interesting thing that makes this race a little bit different for the bike and run special needs bags, uh, they only accept food nutrition items. They do not like in other races, sometimes you're like, well, maybe I want to change my socks in the middle of the run, or maybe I want a, a jacket. Obviously, you're probably not going to need a jacket, but um, they do not accept anything but, if, you know, gels, drinks, powders, whatever you want to throw in there that's a nutrition item is fine, but they do not accept other things and you will not get those back. It's not like other races where they they have it all ready to go later. Um, so make sure that you only put food items in those bags. Uh, the day before, do your either your short shakeout run, bike and swim, either Thursday or Friday, if you're somebody who likes to have the day before the race off or the two days before the race off, Make sure all your stuff is charged. Uh, set out all your gear for race morning, your your kit, your swim cap, your swim skin, your timing chip. Sunscreen is huge, obviously, at this race. Do not waste any opportunity to apply sunscreen. Um, just any time you see somebody who's offering you sunscreen, take it. Um, your clothing, your, your morning nutrition, your after-race snacks, if you need something like that, and your morning clothes bag. Um, and then the day before, yeah, just confirm your, your logistics for getting to the start line and, and where you're going to park, what, what time you're going to get there, all that stuff. Obviously you want to go to bed early, set more than one alarm. I, the thing I love about the new garments is it's, it vibrates. So like, even if you don't hear it, it's probably going to wake you up, um, set a phone, have a friend wake you up, whatever you need to do to make sure that you wake up and put your feet up as much as you can. Um, race morning nutrition, your breakfast should be simple carbohydrates, fluid electrolytes, and a small amount of protein. If you're a QT2 person and you follow our fueling plans, you're probably used to the applesauce, a banana, a uh, protein powder, and a sports drink that covers all those things. Um, obviously you don't want any fat or fiber or extra vitamins or minerals. You want something that's gonna clear your gut very easily. Um, 
and then complete eating three hours prior to the race start. And again, it's going to depend a little bit on what time your swim wave goes off and the waves have not been decided yet, but um, you know, this can mean pretty early start because most of us are probably going to be starting before seven o'clock. So you're talking about a 3.30 to 4 a.m. Uh, breakfast, but uh, you know, it's a long day. Uh, sip on sports drink until race start, have that with you. And then a gel 15 to 20 minutes prior to the race start. Um, probably not caffeinated. Most of us probably don't need to start the caffeine and the extra stimulus for such a huge event that uh, right before the race. And we'll start that later. But obviously that's something that you'll have figured out for yourself. Um, parking and transportation. There's a lot, there's uh, athlete and spectator uh, parking. There's some lots. And again, this is going to be an athlete guard laid out much more specifically, but there are lots of parking lots, lots of shuttle buses. Um, if you're lucky enough to stay in town, obviously you can just walk down, um, but make sure that you double check and make sure you know where you're going to park and where you're going to go. Apply sunscreen before you head to the race. And I would also recommend get get stuff on your lips the worst thing i had pain i had that lingered last year was my lips were on fire i mean I, so anytime you have sunscreen put some on your lips as well um transition is open from 4 30 a.m to 6 15 a.m and when you go through the, it's there's like a one way in and out flow it's not like other transitions where you can kind of walk in and out like you have to sort of start at the beginning which is Behind the hotel, there is, uh, you walk through body marking. You're going to get race tattoos that you can put on yourself if you mess them up or if they didn't give them to you or um, if you need to fix something, they will have people there who can help you fix those. Uh, you drop off your special needs bags at that location and then you kind of walk around the back and then you get to where your bike is and uh you know check your tire pressure there's tons of volunteers because i know most of us probably aren't lugging a pump all the way there and even if you do they do not want you bringing your own pumps in there um there are plenty of volunteers who are there to help you pump your tires if you need to do that um and you know just be careful though because obviously it's cooler in the morning it's going to be in the sun so uh you don't want to over inflate your tires so that they're popping when when the sun comes up uh yeah, like I said, try to do everything all at once. Last year, I, I forgot to put my bottles on my, like I left them in my hotel, which was very close by, but I had to go back and get my bottles. And then I had to walk all the way back. At, like the It's just try to make sure that you do everything all in one uh, one little run through. Um, and then you drop off your morning clothes bag and then you get to the start corral and your swim wave. Uh, there's going to be a time cutoff for that as well. Again, I don't know what that is at this point in time, but uh, it's probably going to be at least 20 minutes before the race starts. So just be very aware of that and make sure that you get over to it. And it, it runs basically along what's going to be the finish line shoot later. Um, so, all right. So the general course overview, we're going to go through uh, the, the swim start and T1 and the finish on the pier. The swim uh, is... And the bike and the run will go through all of uh, each of these courses individually. So, all right, we'll start with the swim. Um, the pros start at 6.25 a.m. And there's swim waves, again, likely every five minutes. That has not yet been determined what the order is going to be, but it's probably every five minutes um, until we get through every age group. Uh, it's an ocean swim, but it's fairly protected. You're not going to be fighting any any huge breaking waves or anything like that uh but it is it can be a little bit choppy it, there can be some swells once you get out there it is extremely salty it's probably the saltiest ocean water i have ever swum in um but that also makes it buoyant so that's kind of nice uh it's also very clear you're going to be able to see the bottom the entire way around which is kind of nice um so the waiting to start as you move up you're going to swim probably about you know, it's maybe 50 yards to the to the swim start from getting it in the water. It's maybe not even that far, um, but they do give you enough time. You, you know, don't don't take too much time, but they they do give you enough time to sort of, um, you know, get there after the swim wave in front of you goes off. Uh, this is a no wetsuit swim for anybody. Don't, you know, leave your wetsuit at home. You can wear a skin suit, uh, you know, it's recommended, but it's definitely not necessary. So if you're somebody who's like, I don't know if I really, 
this is probably the only time I'm going to do this race. I don't usually race somewhere where it's warm. Don't you don't need to spend that money if you don't want to spend that money. It's probably not going to make. It's not like a wetsuit that um, is going to take several minutes off your time. You know, you're talking about marginal gains. So uh, it's totally up to you if you'd rather not make that investment. Um, so the sun is going to rise over the mountain. Uh, and the earlier swim waves, it's actually probably not even going to be uh, over the mountain when you start or uh, get towards even halfway through. Uh, later, it might start to become a little bit of an issue. You're probably going to see it more on the way back once it comes over the mountain. Uh, there are plenty of buoys. It's very easy to sight. There's a lot of people. Um, and... Again, like I said, the water's very clear, so that makes it easy to sight. So don't worry too much about uh, going off course. Uh, you're going to have keep all the buoys to your right. You're yellow on the first half, orange in the second half, and red turn buoys. There's just the one turn way at the end. Um, this is just something unique with a wave start. And again, we're all used to uh, the, the seated starts, I think, at this point. But... Um, you're going to be overtaking slower swimmers in front of you and from the earlier waves, and you're going to be passed by faster swimmers from behind you. So definitely take note of the, the swim cap colors of the people in the waves in front and behind you. So, you know, when you come up on somebody, you're like, Oh, that was okay. Purple went off in front of me. So the purple caps, I should swim past this person. But if you see somebody who comes around you, who has a green cap and you're like, well, green went off after me. And this person like already caught me in the first 400 meters. So I, there's no way I'm going to catch their feet. So don't worry about them. Um, so just, yeah, just be aware of that. Um, and uh, so that you're not getting, you know, either staying behind someone you shouldn't stay behind or trying to follow somebody that you have no business trying to follow. Um, and then when you exit, you exit kind of along the pier uh, on the beach and then the stairs, and there's going to be some volunteers to help you up the stairs. And that's just an overhead shot of the swim uh, course starts. All right. So your pacing, uh, the, uh, again, it's because it's a world championship event, you may be, uh, have some faster people around you than you're used to seeing. If you're somebody who's sort of a, you know, above average swimmer, but not a great swimmer, you may be used to uh, in a regular Ironman, not having a ton of people around you. Um, but in this race, you might have a few more people because there's just faster people, which is fine to just pay attention to that and seed yourself accordingly. Um, you know, maybe start a little further back than you normally would. Um, in the first 200, 300 meters, up tempo, then settle into your tempo. Uh, if you're anxious, an anxious swimmer, start conservative and build. There, It's a big ocean. Uh, you know, there's no need to to get right up into the melee if you know it's just going to kind of cause you some anxiety um you're going to get hit uh it's, even though it's an all-women race and uh there's there's swim group uh or age age group swim waves you may get hit so just kind of expect it and just roll with it hopefully uh and you can stay wide left if you want less contact uh you, and still stay plenty on course so if that's something that you need to do to just relax a little bit and, and focus on your breathing, then that's fine. Um, use the other swimmers to your benefit to draft and sight off of. Uh, and again, like I said, make sure that you're following people that you should be following based on if they're in your swim wave or not. Um, turn buoys must stay to your right. Uh, yes, yeah, stay wide on the turns if you can, because it's going to get crowded. And then increase your kick on the last 100 to 200 yards to prepare for the running. Uh, all right, so now let's move on to the bike course, which I'm sure you've all heard a lot about. Uh, it's one loop. It's really, it's more of an out and back, but we call it one loop because you don't do it more than once. 112 miles, just like every other Ironman or most other Ironmans. Uh, about 5,000 to 5,800 feet of climbing on, I think I got close to 5,800 last year, but again, it depends on what you're looking at. Um, but it's, uh, it's not super hilly. Uh, and then we're going to break it down into little pieces here. Transition to the Queen K, Queen K to Kauai High, Kauai to Havi, sent out of Havi, Kauai High Hill, and then Queen K back to transition. All right. So transition to the Queen K. This is the first 10 miles of the course. Um, 
this is you want to be very careful here it's a very crowded section because there's a, a couple it's a little out and back uh there's a lot of people around it's a narrow road there's not much shoulder there can be a lot of uh like little rocks and stuff in the road so just be careful uh and then there's a couple of little turns that, again they call it like the hot corner where you where you all come through so just be extremely cautious there uh and you know it's it's kind of the perfect way to let yourself settle in and take it easy uh, and bring your heart rate down. You don't just there's no reason to settle in and and you know try to don't try to race through this section. Just try to stay within yourself. Let your heart rate come down and watch out for other people. Uh, there is a slight uphill on the way out and then uh, a downhill on the way back. So that's kind of nice. Uh, that first little out and back uh and then when you come back through town you kind of go past where you went through and then there's a little climb up before you get back up onto the queen k which is where the meat of the course is so the queen k to Kauai high Kauai high is just a little town that you pass through um this is probably where you're going to do most of your training if you pre-ride the course as well so you'll probably know this pretty well uh, there it's slightly rolling hills. There's definitely potential for wind. There's probably going to be less wind early in the day than there is later in the day. Um, but you should be able to settle into arrow as much as you can, uh, and really kind of just ride very steady. Um, the pavement's in pretty good shape, but there is a rumble strip lining the shoulder. So just be aware of that don't ride over that. Um, it's probably not going to feel super hot early in the morning because it's going to be, you know, maybe 8.30 in the morning, um, but don't forget to drink, you know, don't use this, use the time to to get ahead on your fueling and your hydration. Uh, and then towards the end of this particular section of course, before you have one of your few turns, uh, there is a little bit of a, an uphill. Uh, all right, so then Kauai High to Javi, where you make the famous climb to Javi. Uh, this is probably the fastest section of the course. It's uh, it's, it's not steep, but it, it's steep-ish compared to everything else. So you're probably going to get up some, some speed. Um, and then you are going to start your climb to Javi roughly mile 45. It's probably close to 15 miles out to the end. This is where generally the worst of the wind is. Uh, you'll notice the trees actually grow sideways up there because it's windy a lot of the time. So um, there can be crosswind or headwind uh, and the wind can shift. So if you're riding up thinking, oh, uh, you know, well, the wind is in my face. So when I turn around, it's going to be in my back. Not necessarily. The wind can kind of come from all directions. So just be very cautious. Just be very in control during this section and uh, again stay arrow as much as you can even though it's a climb it's not a steep climb but uh it, it just it's kind of a long slog and then the bike special needs is going to be just after the turnaround up there uh the descent from javi uh it's a net elevation loss but uh the wind may not make it feel that way you might have a headwind coming back down and it might you know you might be pedaling you know 12 miles an hour going downhill that's entirely possible uh hopefully not but you never know. Um, so be prepared for anything. And as I said, if just because there was a headwind on the way up doesn't mean that it's going to flip and help you out on the way down. It shifts all the time. It shifts all day long. Um, it's not steep. Uh, but if there's not a strong headwind, you can go pretty fast there. I know that I was riding probably last year we were, we were relatively lucky with the wind. So I know in this section I was riding steady, like 30 plus miles an hour coming down in that direction. But uh, you know, ride within your limits. Always feel in control if you're not comfortable going that fast and you're worried about wind, crosswinds or anything like that. You know, slow down. Be careful. Uh, always be prepared for crosswinds. You never know when a gust is going to show up. Uh, don't forget to drink and eat. I think when you're coming down a hill like that, whether you're going fast just because it's a nice fast downhill or um, or if you're fighting wind and you're just thinking about the wind, you can kind of forget to drink and eat. So do not forget to keep up with your fueling. Um, and again, stay arrow if you can. Your bike is steadier uh, with more even weight distribution with you in your arrow bar. So I think sometimes the instinct is to want to sit up, and but you want to be in your arrow bars and have that, you know, your upper body weight on the front wheel. Um, 
All right, so now the Kauai High Climb, when you finish the descending out of Javi, you make a, a little left, and then this is probably the last significant hill um, on the whole course. And uh, it's, again, not super steep, but because the rest of the course is, is fairly moderate in terms of the climbing, it's going to feel a little bit rough. And then you're back on the Queen K, and all you got to do is ride back to, ha to town. Um, it's again, it's same thing rolling. It's probably going to be windier than it was uh, when you were riding out. But again, you never know what the day is going to bring in Kona. I know last year, like I said, we were relatively lucky. It wasn't too bad. The men were even luckier. I don't think they had any wind. I One of the years I raced there, we actually had a tailwind for this entire section coming back, which was fantastic. You just have no idea, but you just got to kind of deal with it. Um, most likely, it's going to be very hot, although... As I said, there is potential for rain. You never know if it's going to rain out there. I know in one or two of my training rides last year, I got rained on, um, which it, it's not going to make much of a difference, but just be aware that it can happen. Um, use the aid stations as much as you can to cool you down as well as to keep hydrated, especially on this section. You know, grab your sports drink and put it in your bottle cage, but grab some water and, and spray it on your face, on your back, in your neck whatever you want to do there um this is a good section to start doing that to focus on cooling your body um once you get very close to town if at some point the bike course actually crosses the run course it's probably not going to be a big deal for most people because uh it's just, it's relatively late in the marathon and it's so it takes a while for people to get out there um but just something to be aware of there's going to be plenty of volunteers to tell you but it's a little bit jarring when you're like whoa am i riding cross the run yes you are um but they will make sure that you're crossing at a safe point uh and then just be careful on that final short descent back into transition because you do kind of end on a on a sharp downhill so just make sure that you're ready to get off your bike there um all right so your aid stations are approximately every seven and ten miles um uh, again this is to be determined last year they took away some aid stations due to a lack of volunteers. But let me tell you that before there were so many aid stations that once they change it, I mean, there are more than enough bike aid stations. I would not be concerned about there not being enough bike aid stations, but obviously this is something we'll have to double check when the athlete guide does become available to see what they're going to do, or they might change it again, um, you know, right up until race day. But, um, but there most likely is going to be plenty of aid stations out there on the bike. At uh, the bottle exchanges, they have water, Gatorade, Endurance, uh, and Coke. They actually have Coke in, like, sports bottle bars. Hopefully, you won't need that, but it is available. Uh, the Martin Gels, the bars, uh, and bananas. Obviously, you want to carry your own stuff as much as you can um, and use special needs. If you're someone who needs something that they're not offering on course, be prepared to deal with it uh, yourself. And just obviously pay close attention at the aid stations. Don't... Uh, don't get uh, distracted because you don't want to have a crash there. All right, the the gels that, that they have, the black does not have caffeine, the white does have caffeine. These are very low in sodium. I would not recommend using them in Kona as your main source, but obviously if sometimes you, you have to for whatever reason, just be, be aware that you're going to have to make up for the missing, the lack of sodium. Um, and they're very high in caffeine compared to most gels, so that's just something to be aware of. And uh, you know, how you're going to be doling out your nutrition and then uh, the consistency there. We'll have them at the expo so you can you can try them if you need to. Um, all right. So the rate, rate stay bike pacing, uh, you want a U-shape heart rate profile, which means obviously you're going to be starting a little bit high as we all tend to do coming out of the water and then settle in and then uh, hopefully build as the race goes along. Uh, the second half should be two to three beats higher than the first uh, you're likely going to see your heart rate in this race be five beats or so higher than a typical Ironman with lower temperatures. But again, that's something you probably want to discuss with a coach or, uh, you know, how you react to the to the hotter weather. But it, the heat is probably going to affect your heart rate a little bit. Uh, meter out your power evenly on the flats and the gradual hills. It's relatively easy to do that on this course because, again, it is uh fairly rolling and there's nothing crazy steep try to flatten the course as much as possible cap your uh power at 50 watts over your expected or uh, power uh don't overdo it when facing a headwind stay arrow and stay on your target numbers it's really easy to just feel like i'm just i just want to 
push through this wind. Don't do that. Stay on your numbers. Everybody's got to deal with the wind. Uh, you know, be smart. Uh, you're going to be slower, but, you know, keep be smart. You'll, you, otherwise you're just going to pay for it later. Uh, your pace is obviously going to be affected by the wind and the climbing and the weather and uh, rating perceived exertion of five to seven on a scale to one to 10. Um, for your equipment choices, you definitely obviously want to go with your tri bike because you definitely want to be an aero. Uh, you may want to consider using a standard helmet instead of an aero helmet, something with more vents to keep cool. Uh, again, that's that's a personal preference. That's something you're going to have to practice. Um, you shouldn't have to change any of your gearing or anything. This is not a, a course that is going to require uh, any of that. Uh, your wheel choice. There are no disc wheels allowed at this race, so leave your disc wheels at home. Uh, there Obviously, there's crosswinds on the descent, so make sure that you're picking something that you are comfortable with and that you know you can handle if you're a very light person you might want to use something that's a little bit shallower um but your uh and again your front wheel can uh, i should say yeah your front wheel should be a little bit shallower than the back wheel because that's the one that's a little more vulnerable to the crosswinds but again or on the side of your comfort level do what you're is going to make you feel comfortable and uh steady on race day all right these are all the penalties i think most of us pretty much know these. Uh, I'm going to let you review these kind of on your own, uh, but just be aware of all of them. I mean, I my last Ironman, someone got called for blocking in front of me, which I was glad to see because he was blocking me. But, um, you know, just make sure that you are paying attention. You understand all these rules and you know uh, what you need to do. Uh, all right. So now it's time for the run course. It is relatively flat with uh, one significant hill and then some slightly rolling hills. It's about a thousand feet of elevation gain. Uh, it, it, first, you start with a little out and back on a Lee drive. Then you run up Polani Road and then out the Queen K down into the energy lab and back. Uh, there is sun, heat, humidity, a little bit of sea breeze sometimes, and there is pretty much no shade whatsoever. So you are going to be in the sun. Um, so the first section is about four miles out and back. They changed it, uh, this couple years ago or this past year. And, uh, so it's a little bit shorter than it used to be. Um, it's a little bit rolling. There is excellent crowd support here. So it's, it's probably the funnest section, especially cause you're fresh and you feel good. Um, as I said, there's a little bit of a sea breeze, so that can be kind of nice. Uh, then once you're done with that little out back section and, and all the happy feels from all the crowd, you get to run up Polani road, which is relatively steep. It's about mile seven. Um, you know, consider walking up there. There's usually going to be a nice big aid station there. That's going to have a lot of people. So use that as a way to a spot to hydrate and, and get up there. And, but there is a ton of energy to, to help get you going, um, and then the Queen K to the Energy Lab. On the way out, it is more up than down, but it's not terrible. Uh, it starts to get pretty desolate. Spectators start to disappear because it's hard for people to get up there. You might see a few people out there on bikes, but that's about it. Um, and again, the courses are going to cross each other, so you may see some cyclists. So just be cautious of that. Be aware of that but there will be people there to tell you about it. Um, and then you're going to run down into the infamous energy lab. Uh, this is a hot and very long section. It, and since they changed the course, they took away miles on a lead drive and they put them in the energy lab where nobody wants to run. But now we're in there for a much, much longer time. Um, this is mentally the most difficult. Uh, just just according to the miles you're at, you're getting you know, well into the second half of the marathon and there's not a lot of people around and it's very hot. Um, so this is definitely a difficult section uh, mentally to get through and it is slightly downhill on the way down into it. And then you're going to come back up. Well, there's a little, few little out and backs involved there. Special needs is going to be in there if you use your special needs bags. Um, but the good news is once you get out of the energy lab, I feel like it, it it's kind of almost downhill to the finish. It's like back to the Queen K. It is slightly downhill. Um, and then you are going to run back down Polani Hill, which is very painful because that's about, you're going to cross mile marker 25 at that point. So your legs are probably wrecked, but uh, but you're back in the crowd and people are there again. And then you're going to run down famous stretch of Ali Drive, the last quarter of mile of the finish, soak it in. It's uh, it can be emotional. It's a pretty 
uh, exciting thing to get to do. So make sure that you soak in that last little run down there. Um, all right. So the aid stations, again, this is to be determined. Uh, they used to be every mile last year because of a lack of volunteers. They spaced them out a little more. I can tell you uh, this was a little bit rougher. There were definitely sections that could have used uh, that I could have used an aid station a lot sooner than they showed up. Uh, and then especially coming back the last miles on the Queen K, I mean, the volunteers were doing the best that they could, but with people going in both directions, um, they're having a real hard time keeping everything going. So consider bringing your own. Uh, I haven't decided yet what I'm going to do there, but um, consider carrying a fuel belt or something like that or carrying a bottle because it. there are going to probably be times on the run course where you're going to wish that you had um something and you don't although again it might change back double check the athlete guide it might change back they, there might be enough volunteers this year to to field all those aid stations like they used to and it won't be too bad but um th then they have all the standard stuff the gels the pretzels bananas grapes uh broth ice sponges all that stuff do not forget your salt obviously this is a huge race for salt um so uh your run pacing so your heart rate should be your bike heart rate plus five to 10 beats, depending on what, you know, your zones are. Uh, you're possibly going to see your heart rate be five to 10 beats higher than during a typical Ironman race. Uh, that's not this hot. Again, this is something that you're probably going to have to talk with your coach about and figure out the best way to pace it. Um, if you're running by power again, stay as even as possible over the train within reason. And the second half as close as possible to the first half um based on your training if you if you're somebody who can't get a lot of run miles in it's probably not going to look quite like that but it, that is the goal um walk the steep sections as you need sometimes it's just not worth it walking or running up a hill when it, your legs are feeling trashed you know just get to the top and keep moving forward um stay relaxed early uh don't overcook the early miles like i said that section is it's really fun because there's a lot of people around and it's cooler usually because of the sea breeze um so just Stay relaxed, stay within yourself, uh, you know, settle in that first couple miles. Uh, don't chase pace on hills. Follow your power and your heart rate. Uh, you're embracing a perceived exertion on five to seven on a scale of uh, 10. And use the aid stations to keep yourself cool. Take ice, take water, take sponges, take whatever you need to uh, hopefully cool your body down. Um all right, so focus on your goals as your number one priority and the items that you have 100% control over. Don't think about pace. Don't think about, oh, my bike ride's taking longer than it did when I, you know, my qualifying race. It might, and but if you're riding where you're supposed to be riding, it might just be a slow day. So don't don't focus on those things. Uh, you know, focus on your attitude, focus on your fueling plan. Usually if your attitude is uh, you know, not so great. You might need a few more calories. So, uh, focus on that. Uh, it, and, you know, think about, uh, you know, what you get to be a part of. I think that too can help anytime you're feeling down, just be, I am racing in Kona. And for most of us, this is, uh, something that you've probably had as a goal for a long time. Um, so that can help with your attitude as well. Uh, focus, secondly, focus on your targets, your power, your heart rate, your pace, you know, you, you, hopefully have control over these as the race wears on you might have quite as much control over them you might start to lag but um, you know try to focus on those as much as you can stick to your plan uh including how you react when something doesn't go according to plan um and something might not i mean and you might have low points out there you might have difficult times uh and uh but like last year when i was there i i in the energy lab it was just slower and i i just was like, all right, just get through this. And then my last couple miles running back into town were some of my fastest because sometimes you just get through some of those low points and, and move on. Um, and your outcome should be left to the second half of the run, if at all. Like, don't think about, oh, I'm going to hit this number. I'm going to hit this time or whatever. It's just, just try not to think about that. Just focus on, you know, stay present. Uh, be who you are. I think, again, in a race like this, it's easy to get 
uh, carried away with certain things. You know, maybe a lot of people are faster and you're like, oh, I can keep up with that person. Don't focus on anybody but you. Um, and show appreciation for the supporters and volunteers and the family and friends. Obviously, none of this can happen without all those volunteers. They're amazing to be out there, especially in this kind of heat and everything. So be incredibly grateful for everybody who's supporting you on your day. Um, this is just the time cutoffs. Hopefully none of us will have to worry about these, but I think we're all pretty well aware of what those are, but double check. If you're someone who's kind of on the cusp, make sure you double check those. Um, your spectators can follow you on the tracking app. Uh, and then obviously, you, you know, pre-agreed locations along the course, make sure you also figure out where you're going to meet somebody after I kind of one year sort of lost my family. We didn't figure out how to reconnect after we figured that out eventually, but um on the swim, if they want to watch there, you can get a nice spot along the seawall to watch the whole thing. On the bike, there's a hot corner. You can see people come in and out a couple of times before you go out and disappear for four or five, six hours. Um, on the run, they can see you easily coming out of transition or there's plenty of spots all along the lead drive to see you come and go uh, more than once before, again, you disappear up onto the Queen K. Uh, post race, you will have your, af after the finish line, you're going to have your dry gear, uh, dry clothes bags and, and your finished items gear checkout. I have an asterisk there. It says 7 PM, uh, last year when I got there at 7 PM, they definitely were not ready. We, there was a big line forming. So, you know, be patient. uh, you know, hopefully it'll be available, but you're supposed to pick it up by midnight. Um, don't take your wristband off basically until you leave the island. There's a lot of little things that you'll need it for. So do not take that off. Um, come back out and cheer if you can. It's an amazing finish line and it's really cool to watch uh, other people finish. If you are getting an award or if you want to watch the awards, the post-rate dinner celebration is the next night at the at six at the Mayama Beach Hotel. Uh, support the local community. Go to the restaurants if you can. Tip well. Be gracious. Thank everybody. Talk to everybody. So they're very friendly. Everybody I've run into there is very nice. Um, you know, and explore a little bit uh, within reason. And you know, and uh, yeah. All right. I guess that is pretty much all I have. Um, actually, one more note that I didn't mention. I probably should have mentioned it on the run, but uh, because it is Hawaii, because we're close to the equator, be aware that you may be out. Um, after sunset, even if you're a relatively fast finisher, that's something, you know, a lot of us race in the summer months. And if the sun doesn't set in your Ironman location until 830 at night, the sun's going to go down at six o'clock. So, um, you know, just be aware that you might be out there after dark and if you're not used to it. All right, Molly, thank you so much. So much amazing information there and sharing all of your experience being out there. Um, if anyone has any questions and you'd like to come off mute to ask them or throw them in the chat box, please feel free to do that. All right. I always think it's a great Cover sign. everything. It's Sorry. A, I, just, yeah. I just have it's one a question. Sign of a great presentation. Great. One question. Hi, Molly. This is Kate Weiler. Um, I had a um, question about, you mentioned about training for the training rides on the Queen K and I, it was a long time ago since I've done this race and I don't remember. So do you recommend going and parking somewhere to get on the Queen K? Cause you said to avoid those first, that first bit, or can you just go into the logistics about the training rides and where, yeah. what you so, recommend? Yeah, I would probably go up there. It's called Mc I think it's McCalla Boulevard, which is the last hill you go up. And there's there's a bunch of shopping closets there. There's like a couple restaurants. There's a couple of uh, like, I think there's a big Target over there. You can park anywhere in there and just okay. ride up from there. That's where I would, that's where I should say I would. That's where I do go um, and start those rides. Perfect. It's, we, you. You'll just have to take a left at one big intersection, but it's huge. It's very wide and it's, you just have, and there's a light. So you can be obviously very careful there. Okay. Is it Makala, is that what you said? Yep. Perfect. M-A-K-L-A-L-A. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a question in the chat box, which is, when do you recommend starting with sitting in the sauna? Uh, I would probably start that now. Um, yeah, cause we're inside four weeks to go. 
um, yeah, and just do it. You don't have to do it every day. And usually it takes a little time to build up, like just build up to your tolerance. If you don't, you can only handle eight or nine minutes the first day. Um, that's fine. You don't have to do it seven days a week. Just usually I would do it after my swim workouts, uh, because obviously I'm at the gym where my sauna is, get out of the pool, head to the sauna, um, and try not to do it right before, um, you know, key workouts. Like if you're doing a hard run that afternoon or something, don't, don't hop in the sauna and then go torture yourself by, uh, going to do a hard run workout. But, um, but yeah, if you can start that now and just build up to 20 or even 30 minutes, um, but just a few times a week, you don't need to do it every day. Okay, another question. Um, with the special needs bags, will they allow small non-food items, things like Band-Aids or lubricant? Uh, I Theoretically, no. Um, but the chances I would think of them actually checking and, and taking that, I don't think so. Obviously, you're not going to get it back, but not that you would be that concerned that you don't get a couple of Band-Aids or some lubricant back. Um, they're it, you'll see Vaseline. They'll probably have Vaseline at some of the aid stations if you need some of that. But um, yeah, I I would check with that. I'm not positive, but I can tell you that I, I find it, I would find it very unlikely that they would like confiscate it. I don't think they inspect the bags. Hey, Molly, it's Betsy. Again, Hi. another question. <laughs> hey there. Thank you so much for this amazing information. Such a great presentation. I will be studying this whatever powerpoint is if you if it's available hopefully it is um yeah. for us um so you know we typically keep a banana in the transition bag at t2 yep. uh, to you know eat right as you're leaving t2 and i'm just thinking oh my god a banana is going to be sitting in the sun for a very long time yep. is it worth even putting it in the bag or just like as soon as you get to an aid station with banana try to get a banana down I do put it in the bag. It's okay. It's not the best, but also think of it, even if you put it in on race morning, it's still going to be in the sun all day. You're not going to, you're not going to get to it until three, four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, yeah. It's really, it's, I mean, it's never great, but it's not going to be a disgusting, horrible mess. Um, so I, I put the banana in the bag the day before and it survives. It's okay. okay. I put it in my shoe. So it has like some shade. Oh. Oh, okay. I don't know how much that actually helps, but, um, but yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you don't want to do that, they will have bananas at aid stations. So, and there's an aid station immediately upon exiting transition. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that is available, but I wouldn't worry about it. And this is also, you had, you had mentioned that this, this will be available on YouTube so you can watch it as many times as you need. Oh, great. I'll just put it on repeat. Um, if if it's okay, I'll I'll ask another question. Um, sure. For the run to stay cool, did you happen to use like a cooling towel or or like any devices around your neck to stay cool, or did you just use sponges and and ice and just keep uh, keep throwing things down your kit? Yeah, I personally don't. What I what I do sometimes is I'll take a sponge and I'll kind of stick it in the back of my jersey so that it's resting against the back of my neck. Yeah. Um, that's probably the only little special trick that I do. But other than that, yeah, just dump ice down my jersey, uh, dump ice in my shorts, um, yeah. dump water over my head, all that stuff. Um, yeah, I don't personally use any of that stuff. I know a lot of people do and they they love it, but that's not something I personally do. Thanks. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. Anybody Any else? I'll go ahead. I'll ask another question. No, go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> um, so I have, um, I, I've heard from many people like wear a vented helmet. Yeah. Um, so is it worth like trying to find like my, my vented helmet is kind of big and clunky but it's super mm -hmm. safe. It's a wave cell. Um, I don't know. Is it worth uh, pulling out an older, lighter, you know, may not be as, um, may not be like a wave cell, but, you know, it, it definitely will have a lot of vents and um, yeah, just trying to figure out what to, I don't want to 
have like a giant bulb on my head for the race. Right. Um, but yeah. We're just talking about like in terms of like really just any any standard road helmet that you would normally train in that is that it just has a normal amount of vents. I'm just saying as compared to an aero helmet, which usually has like one tiny vent. Yeah. Um, so anything compared to that, I mean, to be honest, personally, I use my aero helmet. I find it okay. It depends on the person. It depends on how you deal with the heat. It might be something that you want to bring uh, more than one helmet with you to Hawaii and try both while you're out there and see what it feels like wearing both. Um, You know, these are usually those kind of things are kind of marginal differences and it depends on how you personally deal with the heat. Um, So yeah, Yeah. it's going to take a little bit of trial and error there. Great idea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have one more. Okay. I promise this is my last. No, this, any questions you have, this is when to ask them. Um, do you pee less on the bike because you're sweating so much? Like, has that been your experience? Um, and where I'm normally peeing two, three, or, you know, last, yeah, last year in Wisconsin, I peed like five or six times on the bike because it was so cold and right. I kept drinking. Um, do you pee less in Kona because you're sweating so much? You should not. Um, you're obviously you're not gonna you unlikely that you're gonna pee five or six times like you would in Wisconsin when it's 55 degrees out. Um, mm-hmm. but you should still be targeting to pee twice on the bike. Um, okay. if you are peeing less, that means you're not hydrating enough. So yeah. um, yeah, you shouldn't. You should definitely still keep the same pee goals as we can we can say there. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Got another one, Betsy? Are we good? Uh, I think we're good. Okay. Anybody else? All right. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, much, Molly. Molly. This was great. So helpful. Good luck to everybody, and I will be there. Um, so feel free to reach out with me, reach out to me if you have any questions or anything that you thought of that you're concerned about or anything. I'd be happy to help you. And good luck and have fun. Enjoy the day. It's a really unique experience if you have not been there before. Um, it's it's pretty special. So, you know, take it all in. That's the goal. Yeah. <laughs>